blessing or a curse to live this long. It's uh, not that long. Hmm? You're not that old. 82. That's not old. You don't think? No, I'm 76, oh. so I don't think 82 <laughs> is old. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess uh, you're only as old. As, I, I don't no, think I'm that old. That's now. right. Me neither. But, but my, my head thinks it's better than my body can do. <laughs> But uh, but I, I do enjoy I do enjoy the excitement of uh, of what's happening as exemplified by this meeting here of uh, all of you people who are interested in various special ways to give people nutrients in order to stay healthy, fit, uh, to be able to perform optimally and to prevent and fight disease and infection. And uh, that kind of summarizes uh, why we eat. And of course, you, we've all heard the old song, or we are what we eat. And uh, I guess when I got into the intravenous feeding, I demonstrated that to my amazement and satisfaction more than I ever knew about because I could change the way people looked, the way they thought, the way they performed by changing the components in the TPN solution. And uh, I worked with some University of Pennsylvania volunteer students, uh, paid them $25 a day to come into the intensive care uh, research unit uh, and uh, fed them by vein. And, uh, that was a nice summer job for them. They just lay around in the hospital <laughs> playing cards, watching TV, and, and I was trying different solutions on them. And it was amazing what they were teaching me because they were strong, healthy guys, and they could tell me when I increased the salt. They could tell me if they had potassium or not in the mixture. Mm. They could tell me the effects of fat when I gave them fat. It was really interesting because they were healthy people, didn't need this, and of course I wasn't feeding them anything but TPN, and to get their reactions, I mean they could tell when I had iron in it or didn't. How did they? They could taste it. Taste it? Yeah. They could taste it. Then I realized that the taste buds work both ways, mm. on both sides of the blood vessel. You could taste it from the mucosal side or you could taste it on the other side. And uh, there are a lot of other things that work that way too. But it was, uh, I, I have had so many spectacular first experiences that nobody else ever did. And probably nobody cares, but I care. And there were times when I had the sheer feeling of joy of discovery. And people have asked me, you know, what motivated me? And although it wasn't the joy of discovery, that was a bonus, but when you discover something new or different in the lab, whether it's a human being or an animal or a test tube, there's a moment in time, maybe an hour, maybe a day, maybe longer, when you realize you're the only human being on earth that knows that fact. Tell us about your first yeah. beagle dog. I'm Did sorry? You? Tell us about your first beagle dog that you started feeding. Yeah. He was a puppy? Yeah, 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 there were puppies. Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, why, why puppies? Uh, uh, first of all, we were trying to, uh, the, the experiment was not only one to, for feasibility, we wanted to see if it was even possible. Um, and then if it were possible, could it be practical? In other words, could it, it could, could it be taught to other people? Would it be successful in achieving the goals? Would it be safe? Could it be done for a long period of time? What were the risks? What were the downsides? We didn't know, but we had to take them into consideration. And uh, uh, we, there were a lot of things we could have done. We could have. Uh, used models. There were people like John Kinney at Columbia and around the country where they were using nitrogen compartments for amino acids and 
and uh, protein, and they were using re re uh, isotopes of carbon and nitrogen to show that you were making fat or or carbon or or glycogen, and um, that was nice, and it was ultra scientific. But quite frankly, surgeons don't give a damn about that. They don't give a damn about what you did for the nitrogen compartment. They wanted to know if you could help their patients survive. Could they fight the infection? Could they heal their wound? Could they get out of bed? Could they get over their pneumonia? Could they return home and go to work again? That's what they wanted. They wanted to touch, feel, taste, see it. And so I had to try to figure, who's my audience here? And in order to convince surgeons that whatever I was doing was relevant to what they do, I had to figure out what, would, what might impress them. And I realized that nobody had ever fed any animal enough and the right mixture of nutrients to grow and develop. And of course the growing animal takes twice as much on average of the nutrients that an adult does. So if you want to figure out what a baby needs, they probably, a newborn baby probably needs twice what you need for maintenance and operation, because they need maintenance and operation plus growth and development. So the beagle, we, we, we had first thought about a rat, and because uh, they're cheap, mm -hmm. and, uh, and you don't get emotionally involved with a rat. Uh, and uh, some people do, but... Uh, <laughs> Most surgeons don't, but, but we were, the technology just wasn't there. They were just too small. And for me to take care of rats at that time, we eventually did, but at that time to grow a rat uh, would have been a, a really Herculean uh, endeavor. So we thought that if we could get a, a small animal like a puppy, mm -hmm. We, we knew we wouldn't be able to work with cats. They're difficult to work with. Uh, so we, and guinea pigs are a little small. Uh, so we thought of a dog. And uh, why the beagle? Because when I looked throughout the world's literature for re nutrient requirements for, be for dogs, you can't just say dogs. You know? Obviously, you don't feed a St. Bernard the same as a Chihuahua. You know, they're two, almost like two different animals. They take the qualitatively, maybe the same, but quantitatively huge differences. <clears throat> and uh, um, I was trying to figure out what kind of dog to do. And uh, uh, as I went through the literature, I found that they not only had dog requirements, but they had the, government printing service that tells you all kinds of stuff. You know, you can write to the government and they'll, you know, they'll tell you how to grow llamas or chinchillas or in, in northeastern United States versus southwestern. They have all kind of little papers on information that very few people really want to have, but it's there. And it's now in Pueblo, Colorado. And uh, they moved it out of Washington. At any rate, there were all these data on beagle puppies and beagles. And I found out that the Atomic Energy Commission, when they were trying to study the effects of atomic irradiation on the flora and the fauna of the world, they gathered all kinds of species of animals and plants and tried to get their learn everything they could about a representative plant in any genus or species. And they chose the beagle as a representative dog. It was, it was relatively small, well-mannered, uh, fairly purebred. They're not a hundred percent. Now and then you'll get a beagle bro that, that's born with uh, dyschondroplasia. Uh, and of course the, the person who breeds them quickly, puts, that, put them, puts them down, because they don't want you to know that they had an animal that was not perfect. Uh, but they're as close to perfect as you can get. Short hair, well-mannered, friendly, not vicious. Um, and uh, 
So I'm um, looking at these beagle requirements, I thought, this is great. And I thought, that's just about the right size you know, to, to work with. So um, we decided we'd work with beagles. But I, I first tried a couple of mongrel dogs that I got from the pound just to work out the technology of the infusion apparatus and to make sure that I wasn't going to plug them in and I'd kill them the first night. Uh, I didn't want a catastrophe. And to, uh, to buy a beagle at that time was 600 bucks. You know, you want to buy a beagle today, it's three or 4,000. They've been named the animal of the year, about, the dog of the year about three or four years ago, and their value went sky high. Um, inflation. But $600 was a lot of money for me to pay for a dog. And uh, I didn't have it, but uh, we got it. Um, but I first bought these $2 puppies from the pound and grew them for about, I think, 24 days. I just plugged them into my apparatus. How did you, and, hmm? how did you, you put the central line into them? Yeah, we, 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 put a, we put a catheter through the jugular vein and threaded it, the right jugular, and threaded it right down into the superior vena cava. It's, a, it's virtually a straight line. Okay. And, and how much, for how long did you have to infuse I'm sorry? Them? How long you have to infuse them? How long, long did I infuse them? Yeah. 24 hours a day. Yeah. So what did they were doing, running with it? Yeah, I had, I had an apparatus that was counterbalanced, mm -hmm. swiveled, huh. connected with a harness. Um, it, was, it, it developed into, uh, you know, we, we started off with a crude apparatus and we, de you know, mo developed it as we, as we learned and, the, and those mongrel puppies helped us work out some of the bugs in the apparatus. Um, parts of the apparatus, for example, were made out of aluminum because I thought that's light, you know, you put a, put a thing on a dog's back, you want it light. So I thought aluminum would be fine. They make B-29s and fighter planes out of aluminum. This would be good. Wrong. <laughs> a puppy can beat it. <laughs> Those puppies would jazz around in that cage so much we would get uh, stress cracks in the aluminum and the support up, they would just break apart. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, wow, uh, we can't use aluminum. So we, we then said, well, they're not gonna break stainless steel. So we made, we made the, the, the little support apparatus on the back out of stainless steel and we made up for the weight of it by putting a counterbalance on it. So we had a weight outside the cage that kind of helped lift up the apparatus on the dog's back so the dog could move. was kind of neutral, uh -huh. about as neutral as you can get. They she could spin guess. around and oh, uh, jump up and down and we fed them usually around 23 hours or 23 and a half a day. And I usually disconnected them for a half an hour for humane reasons. I just disconnected them, put in a heparin lock and I let them run around the lab. I'd block off things so they couldn't go too far and I'd let them run up and then I just was running around to make sure they didn't pee because I wanted to save every, <laughs> save every drop. Every once in a while one of them would pee and I was over to syringe trying to <laughs> recover it. But, uh, um, that, that, that remind us, what year was it? I'm sorry? What year was it? What year was that? 1964. Mm -hmm. 1964. And, um, but no pumps. This was gravity drip? I'm sorry? But no pumps, right? Yeah, they were, we, we, we got, the Beagle Pups were pedigreed animals that we got from uh, a man in Norristown, Pennsylvania, north of, uh, north of Philadelphia. He had a farm up there, and uh, he used to deliver the pups in a Cadillac. <laughs> they, they, were, okay. they were classy dogs. And, uh, but to get the, the, the nutrition, was it a pump? There were no pumps yet at this point, right? Yeah, they were. Like they, we got them. We got them after eight weeks, which is when the beagle mother kicks them off the breast. I'm sorry. Um, no. the pump, mm. like the, oh, the connect, pump. The pump. What about it? Were you using pumps at this point? Had they created those? Were there? I, I don't understand your question. Did you have a gravity pump or gravity infusion? Oh, pump. We had, it was pump. It was absolutely controlled. It was. Absolutely right. Never, we never used gravity. It wouldn't have worked because it, it bounces all over the place, mm -hmm. and uh, so we had we we knew that the principles of that working were you had to use the entire twenty four hours to feed. Mm -hmm. You couldn't just feed for eight hours or sixteen. 
if you wanted to give the animal the maximum amount possible, you had to use the 24 hours. And if you think about it, we were giving glucose, it was like a 24 hour glucose tolerance test for the sugar, mm -hmm. a 24 hour amino acid tolerance test for the amino acids. It was everything that we were giving was about the maximum you could give for 24 hours. So you had to use it. And we thought if we spread it out that way, the animal would be able to maximally utilize what we're giving and not waste it. And, uh, and that was, uh, that was the, the proper way to do it. Um, and we knew it had to be conti continuous at that time in order to have control and to have comparability between animals. Uh, so we had to set up some, uh, some rules. Um, our, our solutions were essentially the same, uh, very little change. Um, we, we had to make some changes as we went along um, based on, on observations that we made, uh, but uh, eventually we ended up with a, a standard solution for beagles. Um, the um, puppies were obtained at eight weeks, then we fed them all the ideal Atomic Energy Commission puppy diet. And they watch, we watched them grow and develop to make sure they grew comparably. And uh, we had pictures and weighed them 